Thank you very much. Um, we've agreed to have a conversation, but we've agreed to start the conversation by asking each other a question. Neither of us knows what the question is. Um, and I'm going to start. Okay. Um, the psychoanalysis takes it for granted that we are ambivalent animals, that where we love, we hate, and where we hate, we love. But analysts never talk about what they hate about psychoanalysis. <laughs> so I wonder what you hate, if anything, about psychoanalysis. Well, that's a great question. I have a lot of things I hate. <laughs> um, I hate its orthodoxy, um, which, is, which goes hand in hand with a conviction that we believe in ambivalence, which I think is much more ambivalent uh, than it uh, advertises itself as being. Um, I hate its disinterest, its classical disinterest in the social world and the very and where it appears, the way that it mostly happens in a superficial way. Um, and what I mean by superficial is imagining that one can just import from other theories and just um, update oneself so as to look and act current without doing the necessary work of breaking down the metapsychology that holds the conservatisms that that are not just um, present in the field, but actually undergird our field. Like in my mind, psychoanalysis needs, I, I love it passionately, and for that reason, I also hate it. My question to you comes from a question that I actually asked you a few years ago in one of, uh, in a day-long workshop that you gave at ICP in New York City. And it was, it was later published in The Cure uh, for Psychoanalysis. And it was a question about the role of the sexual um, in, in Winnicott, but also in your own thinking. Because I've always been very struck by the statement, as many people, this is a very quotable and uh, cited line of yours, that psychoanalysis is what people do, true people do when they agree to meet and not have sex with each other. And yet, if sex is the privileged thing that we cannot do, if there's something, if, if, if sex has a special status, how is it that sex is not something that is talked about very much and Winnicott was a big influence mm -hmm. on you? Mm -hmm. and, um, and in your work, it appears either in oblique ways or kind of like in, in kind of like in the, when it appears directly, it's mostly about your concern about how sex gets very reified. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, I think, I mean, there are several bits to this, I think. First of all, I think, even though it is well known at one level, that Winnicott has apparently very little interest in the erotic. But, but, in his theory of the use of an object, I think that's where his erotic theory is. But it's coded. And that's why I think, in a way, if one wants to have a sense of Winnicott's interest in sexuality, you have to look at all the couples in his work. And the couples are mostly mothers and babies. And I think it gets very displaced and mediated by the mother-infant relationship. Mm -hmm. If you translate it when you read it um, into a version of a sexual relationship, I don't mean literally, but metaphorically, mm -hmm. you can see that this is what's being worked out, mm -hmm. I think, mm -hmm. among other things. Um, I think if you had, as I did, a child psychotherapy training in the 70s and 80s, you had a really de-eroticized object relations training. Mm -hmm. And it was very developmentalist and strange to me, because as we were saying earlier, I mean, I was, I was 14 in 1968, and we, we, me and my friends, knew what was going on in the world. And we did, you know, we all believed in sort of free love, etc. Mm -hmm. And it was very, a period of real, a real feeling of liberation. And one of the reasons I became interested in psychoanalysis was because it was about sex. Mm -hmm. And then I entered into this child psychotherapy training and it wasn't about sex. Mm -hmm. It was about development. And in a way, sexuality became sort of an afterthought. Now, of course, in puberty, you can't ignore it. I mean, in actuality, obviously, if you read Freud, infantile sexuality is the thing. Mm -hmm. That's the point. But of course, there's a way of reading Freud through an object relations lens that makes that pretty minimal. And so it was very, very, a very normative account, if you like. 
and until I read French psychoanalysis. And that's what read. <coughs> but I think the other bit, and this may be <coughs> something I'd be interested in asking you as well, is it would seem to me that now there's a kind of supermarket of ego ideals available. So that so there are psychonic concepts of cure that are really very elaborate. You know, there's you know, on the one hand there's the say the establishing of a secure attachment, the enabling of a capacity for surprise, there's a release of development. There's the thing Ferenczi says, you know, about the patient isn't cured by free association, the patient is good when he can free associate. Mm -hmm. Or it could be the achievement of the depressive position, etc. But there's always a sentence missing at the end. And the sentence missing at the end of all this is, this is what I take to be a good life. Mm -hmm. So a prescription is masquerading as a description. And it seems to me all the psychoanalytic, all psychoanalysis is normative. It's just a question of which norms you prefer and why. And I think that the, the risk has been that psychoanalysis appears to be an account of what life is really like, mm -hmm. or what life should be like at its best, as opposed to saying these are all fictional, you know, and it's rather wonderful in a way, there's a whole range of fictional <coughs> accounts of who we might be and of what we might be doing. It strikes me that kind of like these fictional accounts, however, are always already constrained by what has already been possible to imagine and what has already been possible to formulate. Mm. And um, I think that your your point about kind of like the normative goals that are built into every theory of treatment is like very important and very well taken. I wonder, however, about what, where we might go if we were to think about psychoanalysis as an aesthetic practice, as a practice that is not, um, that is really about, and I'm thinking here not just for the patient here, but especially for the analyst who is the major hindrance in the treatment, um, about what it may mean for the analyst to be in a position where she can risk herself in the treatment, to put herself at risk not only in what she believes, not only in what she might discover about herself, which is a very beloved formulation in Saigon, oh, I didn't know I was sadistic with my patient, but there it is, like I see it now looking back, but also in realizing that the, the unconscious always intervenes and it interrupts everything beyond, beyond, and it makes everything unrecognizable. And I think that psychoanalysis in many ways is, um, I'm thinking of how Jaspers writes his very important critique of psychoanalysis, saying that psychoanalysis pretends, this is one thing that I hate about psychoanalysis, um, mm -hmm. pretends that it is interested in the irrational, but it is actually not. Mm -hmm. Because what it is interested in doing is giving us different ways of transcribing the irrational into rational. Yes, way. or rational account of the irrational. Yes, mm -hmm. yes, exactly. So you may not know why you had this dream, but if you are really able to follow free association, if you're able to kind of like analyze mm -hmm. resistances and the transference, you can get back to what what Barnaby Barnard calls the text behind the text. And this kind of psychoanalysis is immensely disinteresting and boring to me. Uh -huh. um, <laughs> and I hope that it can be boring for all of us because, and I, I, I try to say this also to younger colleagues, we can do much better than that. You don't have to settle for something that is <coughs> Too little. No, but, but isn't what we're up against here the wish to be bored? The wish to be bored. You no, know, because the question is, how, how has it come about that it is the most, to me anyway, the, the most interesting job one could do, and you read it, and it sounds like the most boring thing on earth? Mm -hmm. As though there is a kind of unconscious wish in the profession to sort of kill it, to make it sound incredibly dull, or humorless, yeah. or something, passionless. Certainly. I would say desexualized. Yes, I think that's right. It is desexualized. Mm -hmm. And there's tremendous anxiety around all that. And of course, once you desexualize it, you really devitalize it effectively. Yeah. I mean, but if you're going to take sexualization, this, not sexualization, but the sexual in the presence of the analytic treatment, then you're in a very different domain. You're in, you're in a domain where you're kind of like, not to be too Nietzschean about it, you kind of throw the dice. Yeah. And yeah, you yeah. enter into an adventure with a patient, yeah. which is different than starting out with 
the notion of treating the patient, curing the patient, all words that I, that I have a lot of ambival not ambivalence, like critique about and anxiety about. Um, but that actually requires quite a bit of the analyst. Uh, and not all moments are like that. I'm not mm. imagining like the psychoanalysis cannot be lived, mm. nor can life at that level of mm. intensity. Uh. Um, but without that, like it it falls flat. And how dispiriting is that? Well, isn't the dilemma here that for some people, it, that isn't falling flat. For some people, this is infinitely reassuring. If you see what I mean. I mean, because. And there is people, you mean the analyst or the patient? Both, I think, <laughs> but the analyst. And, you know, it's, it's obvious, in, I mean, it's in your book, but it's obvious in Freud's account of the ego. The ego is about stabilising something, mm. about containing something. And the cost of that, of course, is self-starvation at its worst. Mm -hmm. But it, 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 I think the, the problem, in a way, is to do with trainings. And it's to do with the way in which people are inducted into this. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, because if it's an epistemological project, if the aim is self-knowledge, it seems to me it's already dead. Mm -hmm. Whereas if it's about, say, a capacity to be affected, or some kind of inevitable unknowing between two people, mm -hmm. in which something happens and they don't know what it yeah. is. But that's a huge leap. And it would seem to me that takes time. It's very difficult to yeah. begin with that. Because otherwise, it's as though, if we just take that, which I, I agree with, it's as though we're then foisting onto the patients our idea of what a good life is, as opposed to finding out from them what they might want this for, and then there being some kind of... Yeah, it's so interesting what you're saying, I have two thoughts about it. Um, the first is, I, I think that you're right, that this is certainly not necessarily there from the beginning. And of course it depends on the person, yeah. um, but I would mostly agree with you. But A, um, I'm not sure about kind of like a capacity, about a patient building a capacity for that. I think that one might build a susceptibility for that. Or a or taste for it. Or an appetite for yeah. it, that's yeah. right. But that's not yeah. the same thing as capacity, because to be exposed to that as, as a patient, as a person who is alive, is to always be vulnerable, as opposed to having developed the capacity to tolerate or to yeah. contain or yeah. to manage something. So that's. Yeah. That's the first thing that I was going to say. The other thing is, when, when you're, and you write about this a lot, and it's actually, if I got a second question, that's what I would have asked you. Um, the question of like what kind of life the patient wants to yeah. live. Yeah. Um, and I am, I'm, I'm very strongly ambivalent, both very committed and very suspicious of the concept of autonomy. Yeah. Um, so kind of like, what do we take as this is what the patient wants? And I don't mean this as a, as a way of like substituting it with what the analyst wants or what the analyst supervisor wants or what the analyst school wants or their yeah. program or whatever, or their fantasy of Freud. Um, but I mean it in the sense of to be, for the patient to have a fantasy of what they want and to be asking for it and for the analyst to take that seriously is both important and a huge failure. Well, it, it would be a misunderstanding, wouldn't it? Because it must be fundamental, I suppose, that almost all psychoanalysis that the person <coughs> doesn't know what they want, mm -hmm. or that it's an ongoing process of discovering what you want. And in fact, knowing what you want could be the most offensive thing you ever do <laughs> in actuality. Yeah. Because what it does is it, uh, you know, ratifies or fixes yeah. something. But I think I think it's tricky this because I think I'm interested in something that I'm not sure you are interested in, mm -hmm. which is American pragmatism, <laughs> because. In a way, I was thinking of this when reading your book, which mm. is that in your account of trauma, in pragmatic language, the question would be, what can you use trauma to do? And I know you wouldn't put it like this, but mm -hmm. this would be one way of putting it. So you could, th you could imagine a process where, first of all, you go for psychoanalysis to find out about the problems of wanting. Then you become a pragmatist and you work out how you can get the life you want. But you have to understand something about wanting from a psychotic point of view before you could even begin to think about the life you wanted. But what, what if learn, when you said like you come to discover what you want and that can be kind of like rediscovered and rediscovered. Yes, it's ongoing. It's ongoing and it mm. keeps changing. Mm. But what about, what about 
if we were to think about this not as discovering something, but as as the as the movement that comes that every discovery is the moment you discover it it goes. Yeah. yeah. And yeah. and in that sense it is not a discovery, it is a new kind of like what if every such moment is a creation that propels something, not forward, not backward, but just creates some movement. And what if we didn't resist that? Yeah, and that must be true, mustn't it? I mean, it seems to me that's mm -hmm. actually what's happening. But babies are essentialists, <laughs> if you see what I mean. I mean, that's a, they don't know what they want cognitively, mm -hmm. but they do want specific things. Now, the gap from the breast to the supermarket is <coughs> enormous, because obviously a lot happens yeah. in that process. But it's, it's not as though exactly one begins knowing what one wants, but one begins wanting. And then presumably what evolves through relations and so on is a relationship to wanting and some ideas about what you want. And the problem, it seems to me, is that one is in a hurry to narrow one's mind. Mm -hmm. That it's as though one wants to settle on. Mm -hmm. I know what I want, the only question is how I can get it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. As opposed to thinking, I don't know what I want and that's the most interesting thing about my wanting. Yeah, like I'm thinking there's, there's this vignette that I describe in the book and the interaction between a parent and a child. Um, and I'll, I'll just describe it really quickly for those yeah, who, don't, who don't know it, where it's, it's a mother and a daughter and they're playing a game. Uh, it's a very familiar game uh, to many parents, which is that the child says some version of like, I want you to be the monster, I want you to scare me, I want you to do it really convincingly. And then when I tell you to stop, you stop. And the mother performs that role quite dutifully. And every time she says stop, the mother stops and it goes on for a while. And then the daughter says, she kind of like looks bored and she says, I want to play a different game. I tell you be a monster, you start being a monster. I tell you to stop and then you don't stop. <laughs> so we might, we might ask or try to imagine what this girl wants in that moment. Like what, what is the wanting that may have gotten, you know, for an adult we might say it have gotten constricted into that. But I think that there are also ways to think about wanting as wanting more. Yeah. And wanting more in a sense that cannot be organized into meaning. And that's where the notion of experience becomes very important. Like I'm not saying that this is what ha is happening for this girl. Yeah. But I, I think that it's a very interesting, um, I, I think that it's a very interesting divergence, in my opinion, yeah. to go from Kind of like, what does one want, even as we acknowledge that the it that one wants keeps moving, yeah. to go to, to move away from the content of wanting to just wanting more. And this is where I find thinking with queer theory and queer of color critique to be extremely generative because it works with the more and more of experience in ways that I think psychoanalysis is afraid to. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, I mean, more presumably must have in it the idea of the unknown because it's not, clearly not replication of the same. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's a very interesting thing that, um, let me see if it's ever, um, I can't remember anyway, the sentence is, more is more. Mm -hmm. And it's a very, very interesting thing to have said, mm -hmm. because the implication is obviously, the question is, more of what? Mm -hmm. Well, ideally, um, it would seem to me that you might want more of the same and more of something else. And you wouldn't know beforehand, when you're saying you want more, it's not clear quite what the demand is in this. Because if I eat a chocolate and I want more mm -hmm. and I eat the whole box, I could end up feeling very, very sick. Yeah. That more may not work, but I could have a chocolate and think I want more of something. And that that there might be something in that. Yeah. Well, it's interesting to hear you say like what is that a demand for? Because I would say that it's not a demand for something. It is a kind of invitation for the other to step into the fray of something with you so it's not a demand for the other per I mean it could be of course yeah. to for the other person to do this with you more more of whatever with you but I think that it's also sometimes a demand a, a seduction is the word yeah, that I would yeah. use a seduction into like and not a malignant seduction I don't mean this in the sense of like tricking somebody um, but in the sense of enticing somebody to become engaged from a place that arouses something in them. Mm. Sort of like the, the rousing of, I would say, the sexual drive in them such that they might take the chance. And it is a chance. The more and more is always a chance. 
um, not, to go perhaps to pragmatism, not only is the result not guaranteed, perhaps it's not even the point. Yeah, it could be completely irrelevant mm -hmm. because because success and failure are the wrong it's the wrong vocabulary here, isn't it? Effectively. Yeah, I think experience is yeah. a better vocabulary. This is why yeah. I'm so interested in objection, yeah. uh, and that's why, why I'm so curious in experiences that extend beyond identity categories, yeah. because there you don't have the, the safety net, the tether of, um, of something that could have a referent. Yeah. Uh, well, the idea of identity is obviously a narrowing of the mind, isn't it? I mean, all these essentializing versions in psychoanalysis are the problem masquerading as the solution, because it's as though the project is to, to minimize one's complexity. So if you can get a sense of who you think you are, it's as though then that, that's the answer, whereas of course, yeah. psychoanalytic language, that's the problem. I very much agree with that. Um, I think that like, identity can be so killing. Mm -hmm. And at the same time, there are ways in which some identities need to be articulated and claimed precisely because they cannot be assumed in the world yeah, that we yeah, live. Yeah, yeah. And from yeah. that perspective, those kinds of claims, I think, are not necessarily soul-killing in the same way. They can be claims to something, even though perhaps not to something as specific as, a, like for example, the person who claims their identity as a person of color, somebody who's mixed race, yeah. and is always mistaken <coughs> as being white, but mm. in fact is black identified, mm. and constantly has to assert something, kind of like that could of course also collapse <coughs> into something that is extremely narrow. But there's also an act of resistance there. There's a, a gradient that, that feels to me to be very important. Yeah. Same thing with queerness, with, with um, not all queer <coughs> people, but with queerness as a category, that, that feels incredibly important to me. Yes, and, and it is in, as important as it is to the people for whom it is important. But it would seem to me the question is, what, what do you want to identify yourself for? If you see what I mean, what's the profile in the service of? What is one using this profile of oneself in order to do? Well, I would say that it's not just important, though, for the identity of the person, for the, for the person who's making the claim. I think it's also important metapsychologically to think of the differences. All, all identity claims are not the same thing. No, no. Um, and I am, as you know, deeply suspicious of the notions of identity and the way that we can use it to, um, in a predictive way. Yeah. Like, um, I mean, you know, I, I work with trans people who say to me, like, as a trans person, I shouldn't be doing this. Um, just like women say all the time, like as a woman, I shouldn't be doing that. And that, that's both a constraint in identity, if we think of both groups as minorities of some sort, it's a constraint in identity, but it's also an effort to, to push back on something. Now we could say, well, the pushback is so that somebody can feel more robust, that they can feel that they know what they're doing. <coughs> but I would venture that the pushback is so that something can crack and then something can happen. So if we enter, as analysts, that conversation with receiving that kind of comment, with a certainty that, oh, here you are sh c closing something down, as opposed to allowing the person to do whatever cracking work they might do, and then see what comes, and then if something becomes constricted, comment on it, yeah. rather, yeah. Than, rather than preemptively relate to the notion of identity as in a leveling way. That, I think, is, is... I agree. But the risk, presumably, <coughs> always is everybody who comes into analysis fears being re-traumatised. And they will be. And they will be, exactly. Mm -hmm. And, and the, then the question becomes, so, and what are we doing there then? If they've got this fear, and we know, and some of them know, that is exactly what's happening, going to happen, and that's why they've come, mm -hmm. how does one make this, as it were, alluring, or palatable, or interesting? or worth engaging in? Um, these are, to me, these feel like two different questions uh, in the following way. I think that, um, I think that there's something about trauma that is in and of itself alluring. Yeah. And I don't mean this in the, in the masochistic sense, yeah. like some uh, people are attracted yeah. to, I think that we are all drawn back to the side of the traumatic encounter. Um, we both, we, we are afraid of it, we're also told that we shouldn't want it, that's not yeah. a place to and, make And it's enlivening. 
something it's a, happened. It's enlivening. Yeah. Something happened and something continues to happen. That's that's one of the things that I feel really strongly about yeah. in thinking about the notion of traumatophilia, that the trauma is not something that can be settled, yeah. like its energies are never depleted. Yeah. And that's not necessarily a bad thing. Um, now I forgot the second thing I was going to say. <laughs> but, in a, but in a way, the question is, who decides whether it's a bad thing? I mean, I happen to agree with you. Mm -hmm. But somebody could come along and see us and say, actually, it's a bad thing. This is terrible. Of course. This is the very thing I've been trying to avert. Mm -hmm. And presumably, we can't, you know, we might have lots of ways of re-describing that. But we can't dismiss that. Oh, this no, is a real question. Not. Because the, the potentiality of a real suffering here is obviously great. Great. And... and and not only can we not dismiss it, we also can't just have it as our clinical no, technique to no, act as if we're not dismissing it when, in yeah. fact, internally yeah. we're like, okay, I know what's going on no. here. I mean, that's the other yeah. that's the other thing I hate about yeah. psychoanalysis, yeah. the distance between what we say we're doing and what we're actually yeah. kind of like intending to yeah. do. Yeah. Um, but, but I would say that there is, so a patient comes in, for example, and kind of like is really traumatized about something that is really difficult for them. I think, and, and they will say, like, I, do, I don't want this, I want to stay away from it, I don't want to have relationships of this sort again, it really frightens me, it was damaging. I think this is the way the question of repetition comes in, because even as somebody says, I don't want this, the thing that they do not want still repeats in some way. Yes. So, of course, we know that every repetition is repetition with a difference, even as... Yeah the notion of repetition compulsion would like it, that it isn't, right? Like repetition compulsion tells you you're just stuck. No. So one of my curiosities is, what happens if we allow repetition to build rather than step in as analysts and interpret it or say what it is or notice something about it? What if we don't interrupt experience in the way we are trained to do? Yeah. Because we are trained to interrupt experience. We're trained to... I mean, maybe, maybe we talk about regression here, um, but there are ways in which we're trained to interrupt experience. It's hard to imagine, though, isn't it, of not interrupting? Because it's a bit like the question, when, the, when does the analyst interpret or intervene? Because I might interpret and therefore foreclose future associations that could be more revealing. So there's always going to be an interruption. It yeah. could be about the nature of the interruption. Because the interruption could facilitate a sense of possibility, or it could be preemptive. Yeah. It's like the thing Lacan says about the patient, the analyst explains at the point at which he becomes frightened of his curiosity. Mm -hmm. And that seems to me, that makes sense, yes. such as all yes. the case, but it's often the case. Yeah. And so it, it then becomes a question of, is there more to analysis than endless free association? Um, I mean, I would hope so. <laughs> <laughs> and what would that be? Um, so here's here's an example to take us yeah. back to what we were yeah. talking about earlier. Like, of course, like you know, every time you say something, you foreclose something else. Mm -hmm. But I'm thinking more about how the analyst holds things in mind. So if we go back to this thinking about identity, for example, like if the idea is that identity always forecloses. It, it does, even if you stay quiet, it doesn't matter. If like yeah. th there are ways in which we convey all kinds of things, so to me, like the the point is not about how to think of it differently, but how, as an analyst, to endure it differently. How how to endure the not just the unknowing, but also the pain of surprise, and the pain of not being not just not the one to know, but also the one who may risk their patient. Yeah. And yeah. risking the patient is an entirely different thing than yeah. risking oneself. And I don't say yeah. this nonchalantly, yeah. Yeah. but I, I, I was one of my very important supervisors said to me, I was working with a patient who is suicidal, and the patient was talking about how they want to kill themselves. And I started doing a suicide assessment. And my supervisor said to me, you have to be willing to allow her to die. Yeah to be able to be in that with her. Yeah. And that notion of being able to allow a patient to die can, can, can sound so kind of like superficially, um, kind of like almost like romanticized, like you have a patient, you have responsibility, yeah. and of course I don't mean it in that way, yeah. but I also do. Yeah. Yeah. And this, I don't mean it in this way, but I also do, is the constant yeah. movement that as analysts, we have to not be able to do, but we have to constantly wrest it from ourselves. Yeah, but in order to do that, we have to like risk. 
I'm not saying, I mean, I sometimes do, nobody likes all risks. Yeah. But I suppose one, one bit of this would be, it might be as, I, as easy to idealise the unconscious as it was to idealise consciousness. Mm -hmm. It might be as easy to idealise mm -hmm. ourselves as opaque mm -hmm. as ourselves as transparent. Mm -hmm. and it quite quickly becomes complicated, this, doesn't yeah. it? But here's the thing, I think you're absolutely right, and I was having a conversation with Dominique Scarfoni uh, about binding and unbinding, and he was pointing out that there's kind of like, there's also like a readiness sometimes to go towards unbinding, yeah, and that yeah, too yeah. has to be. Yeah. But I think that once we put it like that, we create a dialectic. We create a dialectic between binding and binding, or taking kind of like, t taking th the taking of risk uh, that is taken at the wrong time or without thinking as much. And I'm not saying that these are not considerations, but what I want to also do is puncture that by saying that we are also, to think this way is not necessarily to idealize the unconscious, it's, it's to be able to have that in mind. You may still do yeah, the thing that yeah. you were going to do, yeah, yeah. but then that thing that you were going to do anyway will come from a different place if you yourself have allowed yourself to be besieged by something as opposed to trying to control something within yourself. Yeah, yeah. So for me, the, the, the actual phrase may be exactly the same, but it can feel so very different yeah, yeah. because of the internal work that the analyst is doing. Um, yeah. I think it's, for, I mean, it's, it's partly about the capacity to be affected, isn't it? To mm. allow whatever it is. Um, but I do think it's very interesting because in British psychoanalysis, as you know, a lot of it is about thinking. Yeah. And it's a real problem, this, because A, I mean, who knows what thinking is, anyway. But that aside, um, there is a real um, preoccupation with maturity and mentation. Mm -hmm. And so it's as though we're supposed to become better and better at thinking. Yeah. Or better and better at knowing ourselves. Mm -hmm. you know, this is a waste of time. But, or and, if we don't do that, then obviously what do we do? Um, I, I think it's Parsons, is it Parsons, with a paper, like, stop, no, it's Steiner, stop that fucking thinking, yeah, like, yeah, there's this right. vignette that's kind of, like, very famous in some of the literature, in the uh -huh. second literature, where the analyst is trying to interpret something, and the patient says, stop that fucking thinking, and I've always wondered why that is not also addressed to analysts, um, <laughs> not just to the analyst, but to psychoanalysis, is preoccupation with rationality. Yes, yeah, so trying to work something out. Yes, yes. Mm -hmm. um, but once, if you're going to step off that ledge, when you say, what else would we do? I don't think that you can step off that ledge with another project. No, but you could, I'm sorry, you, you could think, um, if the project is not knowing each other, what then is it? Because I think the project of knowing each other is a bit of a waste of time very often. Useful for some things, but lots of things, it's actually preemptive in a way. So if we're not going to know each other, what are we going to do together? I think that experiencing... What does that mean now? Not just each, each other, for sure. Like experiencing the texture and the movement of that. <coughs> I'm thinking of the distinction that, that um, Ogden makes between epistemological and ontological psychoanalysis. It's, it's a very popular distinction uh, lately. But there is always the question, I think you're asking it, um, if you're not going to do this, what are you going to do? And my concern with that question, I don't have an answer to it, but I, I, I don't have like a, there's nothing programmatic that I can say about that. But my concern about that question is that it also, it's almost like it's, it's expressing, I'm not saying that you're expressing that, but it's almost like it's expressing an anxiety of like, but how do I let go of that until I can hold on to something else? Yeah. And I'm curious of what might happen for the analyst in one's own thinking. I think this has to be individual in one's own thinking. Like one, it has to be personal. It cannot come out of a school, it cannot come out of somebody else. Um, what happens if one allows oneself to linger in that space? Yeah. yeah. And then yeah. make it a decision about how to be in it each time I knew. It's a lot of work. Yeah. Yeah. And why why would our lives be better if we did that? I think that's an excellent question. I really like this question. I'm curious if you would agree with this. Um, I think it 
first of all, it takes us away from the promises made to us by others, um, and into the terrain not of promise, um, but of possibility. Um, well, you've said a lot. What are you already. thinking? <laughs> no, well, it thinking? seems to be right. It just it makes sense. I think that, again, and this may be my dimness, but I think it's hard to think entirely outside of the promises others have made mm -hmm. to us yeah. and of the promises we want to make to them. Mm -hmm. But it's a very interesting possibility. <laughs> and I do, it must be true that this is really about possibility and about really not knowing what we're capable of mm -hmm. and, and not knowing what we might want mm -hmm. from each other and from ourselves. Yeah. I mean, this is where I would also not want to miss uh, the, the thread of thinking with sexuality and the sexual. And the two are not exactly the same. Mm -hmm. But um, but we we could continue on this path of exploration and completely leave the body and completely yeah, leave yeah. embodied experience yeah. in the room. Like I think that part of what <coughs> analysis can become so boring, how the analyst can take something that is so interesting and make it into something so still, <laughs> is because of um, of how excited. The process can be, yeah. and yeah. how frightened we are of excitement. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. And what I, what I was trying to do in in writing sexuality beyond consent was to talk <laughs> about excitement and like, what it is to lean into excitement. Not because I think this is the answer to anything, but because we are kind of like so cautious and so prudish, even as we try to engage um, thinking about the erotic in psychoanalysis. Like I'm thinking when I was I was having dinner some years ago with a colleague of mine who was saying to me, you know, when I first read Ruth Stein, I, I blushed. And I thought, that's, I'm, I'm glad that you blushed. Like one, yeah, I, would hope, I, yeah. I would hope that one would blush yeah. reading Ruth Stein, but I also wondered, were you blushed or flushed? <laughs> <laughs> and how much easier is it to yeah. talk about yeah. being anxious or embarrassed and about being Exciting. turned on yeah. and, or turned yeah. on. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Arousal really scares yeah. us. Yeah. Um, yeah. 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 May West said, too much of a good thing can be a good thing. <laughs> <laughs> and in a way it seems that's what your book is about. It's about a lot of other things as well. But it's partly about that. I mean, the sense that what would it be like if we were actually more interested in becoming more excited rather than less? Mm -hmm. And that means less interested in a certain version of the ego. Yeah. Mm. Yeah, and again, like I want to underline, like, I'm not suggesting this as the thing that we should no, be no, doing. No. Um, it's really an aporia yeah. for me. Yeah. Uh, so, uh, you know, if somebody were to say, okay, and people have said this to me, like, but how does this translate? Yeah. How does it work? Really work? And I hate that question. Yeah. I hate it with so much passion. And I have people who have read the book and want to come into supervision, and they say, I just want to learn how to work traumatophilically. And I'm like, I know you liked my book, but you didn't read it. <laughs> <laughs> I like, I don't know if you do, but if you remember in Freud's three essays on the theory of sexuality, after about 130 pages of really very interesting stuff, he says, we just don't know enough to have a theory of sexuality. <laughs> <laughs> and it seems to me that's, in a way, in, in the best sense, obviously true, which is that nobody knows what sex is. We can talk about it, but all we do know is we're always outstripping our intentions. And if we then say, well, the way, one of the ways we're outstripping our intentions is sexually, everybody's wired, obviously. If, we, if you say, People are stripping their intentions through aggression. People are frightened. I'm thinking, oh my God. But it would seem to me that Freud, and, and your book is very interesting about this, Freud is really interested in excess. That excess is somehow the heart of the matter. Mm -hmm. Whether it's the excess of, you know, polymorphous perverse sexuality, or infantile sexuality, or simply an excess of stimulation, an excess of excitement, the excess of stimulation of the external world that it's all about that. Mm -hmm. But there's very little excess in psychoanalytic writing, mm -hmm. apart from the excess of everybody's misery. Mm -hmm. yeah. And it is a sort of veil of tears story, fundamentally. You'd never gather from psychoanalytic writing that people really enjoy each other's company. Yeah. <laughs> they, can, they can really have a good time together. Yes, but, but even saying, this is so interesting, 
Yes, absolutely. Freud says um, that you know, he's interested in the excess of sexuality <clears throat> and in the excess of other things. But for him, the other things that are excessive are also sexuality. Yeah, yeah. I mean, he says, like, even like being on a train, kind of like even the kinetic mood. So there's something about beginning to think of sexuality that way that I think really changed. This is what, for me, is Freud's big contribution in the three essays, that it really changes. It's not just having sex. No, no, no. It is not even, no. um, it, it's things that you would not count as having sex or you would see as pathologies, what yes. some people would call perversions. Or more likely to be the things you wouldn't think of having anything to do with sex. That it's aliveness, <laughs> it's another word for a version of aliveness. Or from, the, of, mm, of having a bodily life. I, that, that's interesting because if we think of it as just aliveness, what about sex sex? Like, <laughs> I'm, I'm concerned that when we start sliding from sexuality to aliveness, we lose kind of like the, 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 the texture, the, the, the intensity. What are you concerned about if we get too far away from the intensity? The body. But what then? Do you mean that, that if there isn't intensity in the picture, then we're disembodying ourselves? No, no, no. Uh, I, I understand your question better now. No, what I'm saying is that it's not about having the intensity, it's about not being able to think with it, not being able to sit with it. And if you can sit with it, whether it appears or not, it's, it's kind of a, you know, you, you, yeah. you've lost the... Well, the intensity, presumably, is the thing that already exists. The question is what, what happens to it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Because you could think, in terms of your concept of the overwhelm, mm -hmm. which is a great word because it sounds so wrong <laughs> and then when you reread really the book you think it's obviously right mm -hmm. you could think that experience is an experience at some level that every child has every day mm -hmm. because everything is new because they're new people so they're really in the realm of the unknown and similarly in puberty you could think what you're describing is one version of what's going on mm -hmm. in adolescence mm -hmm. all the time mm -hmm. which is this is way in excess of my capacity, certainly to understand it, but to contain it even. Mm -hmm. And that's both the problem and the pleasure. Yeah, yeah. <clears throat> and then that excess that is in our everyday, that we sometimes resist and sometimes give yeah. ourselves over to, and the, and the, then there's also the experience that this is so amplified and so outside of our control. This is actually something that I was hoping we could talk about, like this concept of will and the bending, what I speak of as the bending of the will in the book, like this whole idea of like things begin, begin to escalate and you don't quite make a decision, no. um, but you do allow something to take you over. Yeah. And that, that being allowing something to take you over is, is quite an interesting moment because it's not volitional, not in the yeah. conscious way. Well, it's like the moment you, I don't know if you did this, but of taking drugs, of taking LSD, where my experience as an adolescent was, I was really frightened and obviously really excited. Mm -hmm. And then there's a moment when you actually put it in your mouth and you swallow it. Mm -hmm. And that's it. Mm -hmm. There's nothing, I mean, you could put your fingers down your throat, but you don't actually. Mm -hmm. And then you can only yield to it. Yeah. I mean, you can try and resist it, you can fight it, but actually, it takes you over. And, and when it's good, of course, it's fabulous. Yeah. And when it isn't, it's awful. I just want to say, like, you know, you, in your, own, your own wording is like so interesting to me, like you put it in your mouth. <laughs> and here we are, like, you know, once you put it in your mouth. <laughs> no. So, I, I, I kind of like, I'm, I'm interested in this, like Muriel Dimon taught me to, to, to listen yeah, this yeah. way yeah. and to think about language this way. <coughs> the sexual, she used to teach this course mm. on sexuality that I took and that I'm now very lucky to be teaching in my program. And she used to say, like, it's not just going to get uncomfortable, it's going to get ridiculous. Yeah. Um. Yeah. Or read it with your genitals. <laughs> yes, that? she used to say that, mm. yes. yes. <laughs> read, read the three S's with your genitals. Um, I mean, I, I happen to think that the three S's is an extremely sexy mm. text. Mm. Um, <laughs> In moments, mm -hmm. I think it's it's a very interesting combination because it goes from being sort of pseudo scientific, mm -hmm. and as though he's laying out some bit of nineteenth century science mm -hmm. and trying to keep everything calm, yeah. because he's obviously very very disturbed by what he's actually saying, yeah. and who wouldn't be? Mm -hmm. um, and then it becomes really exciting and incredible, yes. and it's sort of the worlds in it open up. And you think, oh my god. We could do this, or we are doing this mm -hmm. already, and we don't realize it. Yeah. And I think it's a 
like a lot of Freud, he's really interesting because he's really, really discovering or finding something, and he's really frightened of what he's finding. Yeah. And he doesn't always know quite which the, what the difference is between the two. And that's, I think, what makes it so yeah. good. I mean, it's, it's so interesting you say that. I think that's absolutely right. And for me, the moment that stands out <coughs> in the three essays where you see him really doing that is when he talks about bestiality. Mm -hmm. yeah. mm -hmm. When he says that kind of like the, that the sexual drive can actually override the distinction between the species. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. And that's a really interesting <laughs> moment. Amazing. Because if you stop and think, like, he's really talking about bestiality. Mm -hmm. And then he really pulls back. And it's almost like you've seen him, like he's let it go, mm -hmm. go, go, go. And, and then he's he like, whoa. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yes. Uh -huh. oh, oh, oh. Oh. Which are your favorite <coughs> Freudian texts? I love the three essays. Mm. Um, I like early Freud. Mm. Um, yeah. I like the project. Yeah. I really the project like the is project. really interesting. Mm -hmm. And I was not taught the project while I was in training. No, I wasn't really. Yeah. Uh, what about you? I, s I love the project. I like some of the interpretation of dreams, mm -hmm. and some of it's boring. But some of the, the unboring bits are thrilling, it mm -hmm. seems to me. Um, and I think, in a way, dream work is his best idea. Mm -hmm what his best idea is, but it's a very, very compelling one. Um, I think the three S's are very good. I also think civilization is just intense, mm -hmm. it's really interesting. Mm -hmm. And I think beyond the pleasure principle is really interesting. Because that's almost where he does panic. Where yes. you know there's a huge relief that there's a death instinct and that in fact we don't want to be excited, we want to get rid of excitement. Yeah. The project is now getting rid of excitement. Mm -hmm. And it's a very interesting moment because whether or not you agree, you think, mm, is it? Mm -hmm. Or if we don't want to get rid of excitement, what do we want to do with yeah. it? And is it like that? Yeah. I think, you know, in, in the clinic, like, I remember, like, being in supervision when I was in training um, and seeing how differently these moments of excitement are treated yeah. for some patients as yeah. opposed to others. Yeah. So kind of like non-conventional sexual desires get a very different treatment around the process of excitement, the notion of excitement, yeah, yeah. Um, than the kind of experiences that you would catalog under like, but this is what sex is supposed to look like. Yeah, yeah. Um, this is what interests me about going like off, like off the, the boundaries of what, because it's not that we, all, we don't always, this is what I'm trying to say, we don't always have trouble thinking about excitement. We have trouble thinking about excitement in certain domains as opposed to yeah, others. Yeah. So somebody who's really excited about poetry, we're going to treat that very differently. Yeah, um, of course. And, and you actually talk about some of that as one of the things that I was curious to hear your thoughts about in, um, when you write about conversion. Mm -hmm. And when you write about kind of like conversion both in the economic sense of the word and also the conversion, of, the conversion that comes with change. Mm -hmm and the conversion of another person into something, as in conversion practices. Mm. Um, so I, was, I would love to hear you talk a little bit about that. It's in the book, as you know. Yes. <laughs> but I suppose what, when you said it, what I thought was, I think it's worth wondering what isn't a conversion experience. In other words, when one changes, let's say we become really interested in psychoanalysis. Mm -hmm. Well, we can't, you know, either we hear something said, we read a book, we come across it. and. Obviously, some people then are not interested, but we, probably everyone in this room, it took, it went on really engaging us for some reason. Well, is that a conversion experience? I'm going to decide this, but is that a conversion experience? And if it is, what's happened? Mm -hmm. You know, and, and what's, I think, again, what interests me about conversion experiences is, what's the continuity between the unconverted self and the converted self? Because clearly, it isn't abolished. It's not as though literally we are completely new people, mm -hmm. but something's evolved which looks like extreme newness. Mm -hmm. And I think that's in, it, in and of itself very interesting. Mm -hmm. But the wish for conversion, I either wish to be a completely different person, and the knowledge somewhere that it's not entirely possible. How do we think about that in the context of others' wishes for conversion? And I don't just mean this in the sense of like therapists who have specific ideas what, about what, say, religion or gender or sexuality their patient might be but where in that trajectory of wish do you see the others seduction I mean presumably one question behind that question is where do the wishes come from or on whose behalf mm -hmm. are we wishing mm -hmm. 
because wishes are their forms of prophecy aren't they and they're also omniscient mm -hmm. in a moment of sort of getting get to know about them and again psychoanalysis often has a very disparaging view of wishing as though something, wishing is something we need to learn to see through mm -hmm. as opposed to <coughs> We might, we might learn from psychoanalysis how to wish better or how to wish more satisfyingly mm -hmm. or more excitedly mm -hmm. as opposed to thinking, well, there's a thing called a wish and it comes up against reality mm -hmm. and, then, and that's what we need. Mm -hmm. And this is, A, obviously boring, but also it's a very limited model of what actually happens mm -hmm. as though there is desire and frustration and that's kind of it. Mm -hmm. And everything happens in the gap between them. And there must be better stories about this. Mm. We have five minutes, we're told. I do. The timekeeper, thank you. Are you interested in your work in dreams? Because there are no dreams in the book. I mean, there's no reason why there should be, but. Mm -hmm. Um, not as much as psychoanalysts are supposed to be. Mm. Um, and, and why? Oh, I don't really mean why is that, but yeah. what's that? What does that come from? That thought. I think I think I'm just not good at it. Um, <laughs> I'm not like it's not something that. But isn't it interesting that one is induced to think about it like that? That I'm not that good you could, at yeah, it. That we could be good at it, or we might not be very good at it, which we not just leave it aside. Because then the question is, well, what would it be to be good at it? Yeah. I, I don't, I mean, I, I think that's really interesting. I think that I don't have an interest in dreams. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, uh, yeah. yeah. And I know that this is, uh, I, can, I can hear so many of my supervisors chattering in my head and so many people I respect who do amazing work. I, I, mm. By the way, I'm not saying that dreams are not interesting yeah, yeah. or that dream work yeah. is not interesting. Yeah. I kind of like. I think that some people do really interesting thinking work with dreams, and thinking work work on themselves with yeah. dreams. As, yeah. as kind of like, but to me, it's never. It's never. I've never been drawn to them in the yeah. same way. It's yeah. been the rare time. Yeah. Um, yeah. There was a very interesting analyst called I think James Hill, who was an early English analyst, who said, writing about dreams. Um, dreams are not the royal road to the unconscious. Mm -hmm. Consciousness is. Mm. That's really interesting. Isn't it? Uh, yeah, mm -hmm. it's a complicated communication, but it is very interesting. Yeah. I mean, it's also, I mean, yes, but tell me how this sounds to you as somebody who's more interested in dreams than I am. Um, but it would seem to me that the dreamscape gives you, it's, it's the neon sign that says, look here, as opposed to consciousness. That, that does not have the privilege of, a, of being an isolated site unless you have a parapraxis or unless yeah, you have yeah. an error that, um, yeah. in, in some ways, it's almost like the dream puts something into a platter. Yeah, it does, um, yeah. And the platter's obviously been provided for us. Mm -hmm. But don't you think this is really interesting that everybody's sitting here listening to this and maybe people may have been more or less interested and somebody tonight could dream about your glasses Mm -hmm. And they may I have. Hope a, they will. And, and they may have. I hope they will. So they don't. You won't have been right now. But they may have had no knowledge of any interest or perception in your glasses. Mm -hmm. Somebody could dream tonight about your glasses. Go to the analyst the next day, and it will be by association much, much more interesting than anything they heard here tonight. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So there's something in us Absolutely. that is interested in something else. Yes. And that seems to be fabulous and part of the romance of psychoanalysis. Absolutely. And I'm really, your phrase, there's something in this that is interested as opposed to there's, there's an interest in yeah. or somebody yeah. is interested. Yeah. But there, that, 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 that um, this, there is something in it, that there is an interest in it. Yeah. Force, so yeah. to speak. That, that is really appealing to me. And that we're actually in the dream day. Mm -hmm. I mean, we're, we're in this day, so yes. but we're also in the dream day. Mm -hmm. And there's nothing we can do with that or think about it except acknowledge it. Mm -hmm. But something might happen overnight. 
and we have no idea what it is. Or right now, in the q and Or right now, yeah. yeah. Right now. <laughs> yeah. Perhaps we should stop there. Thank you. Right. <laughs> We now have uh, half an hour, and if you'd like to put your hand up, I'll, I'll hand you the microphone. We don't expect anyone to make something happen. <laughs> <clears throat> well, well, I wanted to ask, just um, given your sort of shared um, suspicion of the imparting of analytic facts, um, where do you see the place of insight in, in, the, in the clinic? Do you want to go first? Do you want to go first? Uh, <laughs> um, I've n it's never felt like a very alluring word for me. Mm -hmm. um, it does seem, my own experience myself and doing psychoanalysis, there are areas of one's life where social insight is useful. It seems like whatever insight is, and it seems useful. For me, it's the least interesting bit of psychoanalysis because I don't, I'm not interested in acquiring more knowledge. And I'm not interested in, in my own case, having more of a sense of myself as though I was a character in a novel. Because I, in a way, I think for me, the aim of psychoanalysis is to be able to forget yourself, not to know yourself, to be free to be absorbed in other things and other people and so on. Because to me, this is not a modest comment, other people are much more interesting than oneself. And that's, for me, what psychoanalysis is about. It's about freeing people to be able to be interested in something other than themselves. I mean, my answer to that would be, I'm more curious in the word role than, um, kind of like, an insight in your question. Kind of like, so when you say, what is the role of insight? I think that the role for what and the role for whom. Mm -hmm. I think to many patients, like certainly to me as a patient, sorry, insight has mattered. As I want to understand this about myself. And it does a certain kind of work, just like recognition does a certain kind of work too. Like these are not to be dismissed. And for sure, like the kinds of thoughts that I have are not about like throwing everything else out as if nothing else has been said and none of that is useful. It's to actually push back against our deep fixation on thinking only that way. Uh, so is insight important? Absolutely. Um, but we have to be able to think beyond that. And if we stay with it's important, then I don't think we can go very far from that because it's, it's too reassuring yeah. for us and for the patient. Um, Hi. Um, I wanted to ask something, I think, about what you were saying about uh, psychoanalytic writing being boring. Um, so I'm very interested in psychoanalysis and have been in psychoanalysis for 10 years. And I'm writing about it from the perspective of the patient. So I'm very interested in psychoanalysis. But I sort of stopped reading psychoanalysis I, I didn't read that much, but I stopped reading it a while ago um, because I found it very boring and sort of flat. And recently was reading, um, occasionally can read a bit of Winnicott or a bit of Ogden because they're a little more human. Um, but I was reading Ogden recently and was sort of quite excited by the beginning of it because it was very, a very human introduction and then sort of flattened again for me into something, um, well, my question um, is that even those writers who seem to write in, at times quite an alive way, what I've often been confused by is what they understand these concepts to be, whether they understand them to be metaphors or not, um, because I have never been able to understand that, and I'm sure it's different for different psychoanalytic writers, but they begin to write about it, whether it be the structure of the mind or the processes of the mind, 
as this is this and this is that. And there seems to be a lack of awareness of what are we talking about? Is this a metaphor? Is this a... And I was just wondering if you guys had any thoughts about what do you, what do you think they are saying? Are they saying it's a real thing? Is it a metaphor? I feel very shut out by that. I mean, I, I can only give you an impression, um, which is to do with writing that seems alive to me. So this is not a, an objective comment about the writing, mm. but I'm just struck that there are some psychotic writers, few, that I love reading in the way that I love reading certain novelists or poets. And I couldn't always tell you why it works, mm. but I do know that there, it's as though the, the language is, it, is it A, in excess of the intention behind it, mm. and B, it has something about it that is actually alluring. You want to go and read it. It's a Somebody, somebody whose company you enjoy. You can hear, I can hear a voice on a page, and I want to go and listen to it. And it's a bit, for me, it's either got it or it hasn't. And I found, certainly with psychotic writing, I would only read the things you immediately love and like, and not bother with anything else. I wouldn't, in other words, I wouldn't try and get over a resistance with psychotic writing, because too much of it's bad. And there's a very interesting thing that I, um, there was a British philosopher called Bernard Williams who said, unimaginative work comes from arguing with the wrong people. And it seems to me there's a lot of wrong people in psychoanalysis. This is great. I think it can't be said often enough. Um, to me, the, um, the writers that I find interesting that have this quality of, like, I just want to keep those keep reading, are writers that are not addressing me. They're not trying to teach me something. Mm, yeah. They're not trying to convince me of something. It's almost as if they're having a structured and curated conversation with themselves. And I'm kind of like almost eavesdropping. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. like, I, like when I read, I want to feel irrelevant to the text. Um, I want to feel like I'm just there as opposed to um, somebody wants something from me. Um, probably tells you more about me than, <laughs> than writing, but there you have it. But it is an interesting idea that one is overhearing something, mm -hmm. that you're overhearing somebody's internal delirium mm -hmm. um, rather than being communicated with. Yeah, and, and as you said, like when you, when you write about this too, like, like kind of like part of what makes good literature not discourse, not theory, is that kind of like the words exceed the intention. Yeah. The same goes for poetry. But I'm also thinking there's a word in Greek that we don't have in English. Um, the word is afugrazoma, um, which is almost like, almost like eavesdropping on oneself, or eavesdropping on something, but also listening for the sounds. And, for, <coughs> and it's not about discerning somebody's intention or discerning somebody's plan. It is more about just tuning into a vibration, yeah. so to speak. Yeah. And some writers write like that. Ogden writes like that sometimes. Uh, sometimes he doesn't. Mm. And I, I want to be actually very generous with that because that's a lot to ask of anyone. Like I certainly would not be wrong to be judged by this criterion. Um, but you know, I mean, you write in a way that is extremely. Um, it's like you, we hear you think, and that's I think what makes yeah. your books very. Um, not just readable, but interesting. Um, but you're not teaching. No, uh, no. I think it is very much about the sound of it. Mm -hmm. It's about the sound of the sentences. Mm -hmm. I think it's right. Wow. Do you think about the sound as you write? Yes, I mean, mm -hmm. if when I'm writing, I basically just write, but if I get stuck, the question is always, not is it true, but does it sound right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And sound right means it sounds satisfying to me at that moment. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think you need to move. Sorry. No, it's only a small 
that you'll have to get there. Um, but just on that, I was thinking, <coughs> I was talking to a friend recently about sort of Ben Lerner. He's a big fan of like John Ashbury and people. And Ben Lerner has a lovely thing, I think, in training the training in the torture station. But the protagonist who's basically Ben Lerner's metaphor never he talks about when he's he's American and he when he's reading Spanish or trying to read Spanish, he can read Spanish pro poetry way better than he can read prose. Because like there exists within this lack of understanding the language, he can get a sense of the feeling, which overrides everything. And then he sort of panics and not you know to sort of comprehend that, then steps back and then understands and that is the entire thing if, like, of itself. And I guess also my well, question, I guess, I obviously read you many times talking about sort of your relationship to poetry and the poetic, and I was wondering whether you have a sort of history or your sort of dynamic with that sort of realm is. Mm. The description that you were giving made me think of somebody reading Lacan. Um, <laughs> <laughs> that kind of like you kind of go into it with a faith that something will happen, but you don't necessarily understand what is going on. I was actually encouraged to read him this way, probably because I couldn't read him any other way. Um. John Ashbury said in an interview, um, the question was, why is your poetry so difficult? He said, well, I noticed that when you try and communicate with people, they eventually lose interest. But as if you talk to yourself, they want to listen in. <laughs> <laughs> and I think it's a better model. Yeah, he said also, like, something along the lines of, like, poetry, we try and attack it, so it won't come to you. But if you <coughs> ignore it, it would be like a cat brushing up against your yeah. leg. Yeah. Which I think yeah. is really yeah. beautiful. Thank you. This is a wonderful conversation. Um, I want to pick up on the word overhearing, which you use, Adam, in response to Avi's description of um, mm -hmm. wanting to be wanting not to be addressed by a text mm -hmm. and that there was something about that impersonality that made it maybe gave you more space to engage with it but it was I was caught by the word over here because you know we might use the word over here in the sense of eavesdropping we heard something that wasn't intended for us which is also exciting but I want to think about the over and over here and hearing maybe hearing over and over again and what the repetition, even this, like the sound of a sentence, but I, and maybe I'm thinking with Laplanche, like what does it mean to, like the over here to have to make sense of something? Also, I, I, I'm struggling even to. There's something about that word over here. I mean, we listen as clinicians. We listen, listen, listen. But are we overhearing? And as a and maybe that's a virtue, which is maybe goes back even to the the resonance of the reverberation that you were speaking about, Avi, also in the way in which a, a text works on you. Not at the level first of meaning, and maybe that's the kind of overhearing, which isn't yet about content. I hope this is making sense. It's also, yeah, yeah. it's also the maybe go back to the word experience, which you use several times. Of you, the an experience which there's the in some sense the loss and the excitement of trying to find words for an experience that are always, you know, producing something other than that experience, yeah. and that also has a sense of a kind of overhearing. It's what gets lost once you take the overhear and put it into. Curable like else. I would think that that's where we actually might move from thinking about psychoanalysis as a literary practice from uh, to thinking about it as an aesthetic practice, mm -hmm. because overhearing is <coughs> like that over over overhearing that you're talking about is also about underhearing, mm -hmm. like meaning, like to to have something repeat repeated so many times that you actually begin to lose your meaning of it, and that's actually. Of speaking about over, it's also the overwhelm of like, not just being overwhelmed mm. by something, mm. by one thing, but being broken into mm. something, into an experience, and then whatever comes from it is usually what we attach to. Like, you know, I felt really overwhelmed, like I, I was really broken by this experience, encounter, a work of art, and then I now understand X or Y or Z about myself. Like by the time that it gets sutured together back into what you understand about yourself, it will, there's no way around it, but by the time that happens, it's over. The experience is in the in-between, it interstices between the over and the underhearing. Um, that, that's the place of the aesthetic for me rather than the place of the literary. Um, yeah, that's really interesting. I mean, when you said it, you kept repeating the word, I was thinking, obviously, it's topographical. Over here means over here. Mm -hmm. Um, and there's something of that. It also, Freud talks about over-interpretation in the interpretation of dreams. 
and presumably over-interpretation means interpretation that becomes redundant by its insistence. Whereas I would have thought the thing about overhearing is that one's only going to notice overhearing something if either one is struck by the content of it or struck by the fact one's overhearing it. And both those things are powerful in different ways. But I, I would have thought it would be interesting to know what one would give as an example of overhearing something in the way you were intending. Because it does, as you say, be like repeating a word. Something would dissolve. It was as though you heard it and then you stopped hearing it or you heard something else in it. Or that this game that sometimes some of us played as kids, I certainly played as a kid, like repeating a word again and again until it loses its meaning. Yeah. And then you begin to feel dizzy. Yeah. And kind of like, uh, I'm thinking of like, kind of like, um, you know, for Plato, feeling dizzy is the beginning of philosophizing, mm -hmm. right? Um, so that dizziness is actually quite, it's the state to be in if you're going to stay on the domain of the aesthetic rather than. Um, Hearing it's very nice having both of you enjoying each other. <laughs> um, I agree, Adam, that uh, Winnicott's uh, use of an object is his most er erotic text. Uh, I remember when I first read it, it reminded me of the Bill Withers song, Use Me. If it feels this good being used, then use me up. And I didn't quite know what to do with that in my training. Mm. It seemed like it was prohibited to get used up. So I was thankful for Avki's book because the sense of overwhelm in the using up, both for the analyst and for the patients, mm. is I think part of what well, it is that that is mm. the that is the, the, the thing that we're doing. Mm. That's the thing that we're trying to 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 um, to, to, to to be without this kind of um, normative sense of uh, being masochistic or, mm -hmm. or, or the rest of it. Um, but it's that sense of also that they, where it was really only applies it in a sense to the analyst as the object that's being used mm -hmm. and enjoying it, that the patient also becomes somebody who enjoys being used by the analyst in turn. I mean, used up has a connotation, doesn't it, of depletion. And it would seem to me there'd be one way of thinking about this would be, um, <coughs> if the experience is depleting, then somebody is depleting somebody. Or something is being done to an experience to diminish it. And I mean, you write very, very interestingly about being used up in a completely different yeah. sense mm -hmm. of this. And that's much more interesting than what I'm saying. But in the, in the depletion version of this, it's a. It would seem to me something's happened to the exchange to make it parasitic. It's also can be orgasmic. It could be, but but then the question is whether "used up" is the right phrase. Because mm -hmm. it is used by Shakespeare in the sonnets, mm -hmm. the idea that you're spent, mm -hmm. you're used up, and that would be, as it were, the benign version of it. But I think the ambiguity about it is interesting. Yeah, I, I'm, I really like this used, used up uh, way that you're introducing this, Andrew. Thank you for this question. I, I do have like very different thoughts about depletion, which can be a state that I don't necessarily see in an object-related way. Of course, it can be that as well. But I think that we can think beyond that to think about states of depletion, of being, of exertion, um, of, um, of the using of the other for one's pleasure that that do not have to fall into the exploiting exploitation um, ex exploited ex exploiter uh, mm -hmm. divide and I'm thinking of um, of course Bataille is the theorist kind of like who works without the notion of expenditure and the idea of being given be, being taken over not as an act of domination insofar as the, the, the taking over, which I think is part of what happens in analysis, the taking over is also about making oneself vulnerable, not only to the other, but also to oneself, like to the opacity in oneself. And from that perspective, I think that being used up is, is actually quite interesting and exciting and, um, and, and fraught with the sexual 
in ways that open up to a variety of different ways. And this, this is part for me as kind of like somebody who reads queer theory, but who's also queer myself. Like this is part of what I see in, like in thinking with that domain that helps me not get caught in the anxiety that I kind of like even I sometimes feel about the notion of uh, like being taken over uh, and to think of being taken over as I mean, in a good analysis yeah. no. two people get taken over no. by each other and the patient becomes pre like preoccupied with the analyst and to some degree the analyst with the patient as well uh, and we work to make that happen we get trained meticulously to create the conditions for that to possibly arise uh, sometimes hard to articulate these questions. I'm a better and, or perhaps more confident child analyst than I am an adult analyst, but this image that you gave earlier of not letting go of, say, one vine before you get to grab the next vine, or having to be, or being able to tolerate sort of that in-between in space without knowing where you're going and obviously leaving where you come from is a very frightening, that's a very frightening moment. And I think if I would come to have this lovely conversation with you about this, I would, I would perhaps not be so frightened mm -hmm. by, you know, by hanging there in that experience. But in teaching people and sort of to, to do psychoanalysis and to experience their work the way I think you're you're wanting people to learn, or you're wanting to people to count on more. Um, how do you how do you uh, develop a, a capacity to feel to let go of your developmental, you know, what you lean on, your developmental theories, or the development, the information that that you have that that would keep you. Um, feeling steady, and um, just as an uh, added confusion, um, thinking about the, you know, doing uh, psychoanalysis or psychotherapy in, say, um, occupied territories or um, war, war zones, um, you know, sort of what do you, I'm looking for what you need to sort of help ground yourself in all of that while you're in allowing yourself also to go into a space that's Mm -hmm. I mean, this kind of like better, um, you're better expressing the kind of like this metaphor of a vine to vine, kind of like it's, it's much better than how I put it before, so thank you for that. Um, this is going to sound too programmatic, and I don't mean it this way, but I don't know how else to, to answer this. When you say, how do you develop a capacity for that? I think, first of all, by not trying to develop a capacity. I don't think this is a capacity. I really don't think this is a capacity. It's not an ego strength, it's not a skill, it's you not... Mean in the Winnicott sense? Are you using that tower? You, you mean it's not a capacity in the, sort of the Winnicott I, sense? I, I mean it in the sense that you have to steal it from yourself every time, and yourself is not going to want to give it to you. And if you ask me, how do you steal it if yourself doesn't want it? And could we get into the question of what agency is agentic? And so we're going to get into a very long discussion that I would love to have, actually. But uh, <laughs> nerd that I am. Uh, but, but, but I do think that there's something about if, if you are you, not just you, if you're thinking, how do I go from one fine to without harm to the other by being grounded? And by having the capacity for it, you're already reaching for a vine. And like I, I know that what I'm saying is I don't mean it to say cryptic, but it does have to be an answer that each person comes to on their own. Um, it, it has to be yours. It can't be anybody else's. But that's the only thing that can you can be present with in yourself. So But do not <coughs> think also that there are things that can be as a way usefully communicating. So when you asked the question, I thought this is really a question of sensibility or temperament. Some people are drawn to this and some people aren't. And that may be true a bit, it's not that true. It seems to me in doing analysis, you can certainly um, look at with people what their repertoire of untaken risks is. In other words, the risks they find alluring and interesting and exciting 
but for whatever reason they shy away from. And that's somewhere where insight might be useful. You can also, it seems to me, and this is very cognitive and very object relations, I'm sorry. <laughs> um, it's okay. You can also suggest um, people make, doing experiments in living. Mm -hmm. You know, live next week as if you aren't shy. It's like method acting, but you try it out. And hopefully they will know that we, as the analysts, are, broadly speaking, on the side of their pleasure. Not knowing what their pleasure is beforehand, but that when and if they find it, we'll be there. I, I think there's something to that that is so important. Like, I, I love the phrase, live for the next week as if you're not shy. Because we, we don't know what it's going to set in motion, no, right? And no, it can't be said no, to everyone no. without somebody feeling... Some, some people may feel ashamed by that. Yeah. But, but I, you know, I'm thinking of um, a patient who, who tells me she wants to paint, but she can't paint. And I, I said to her the other day, paint anyway. And this is not the sort of thing that I was trained to say, but it's so much in keeping with this. And is it an instruction? I don't see it as an instruction. Um, I see it as try to push back yeah. anyway, yeah. and let's see what comes. So the question of whether she comes back with having painted or not is really irrelevant to me. Yeah, um, yeah and something's only an order if it's heard as an order. Mm -hmm. And if it's said as an order, yeah. 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 I think both, yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. Um, one of the reasons that... Could you, um, oh, have you got the... Yeah. yeah. Okay. Um, one of the reasons that I'm really interested in um, both of your work is, um, as, a, as an artist, you both speak... Um, I'm interested in your work because you both um, speak quite a lot about aesthetic experience in relation to psychoanalysis. Um, and I was, I was really interested in what you guys were just saying about the point at which language kind of fizzles away. Um, and yet, yeah, psychoanalysis is conducted through language almost all the time, and it's spoken and it's written about. Um, and I guess, yeah, I'd, I'd be interested to hear a bit, um, hear you both maybe speak about um, the, I guess, because the reason that people quite often make art rather than use language is because of trying to communicate something non-verbal. Um, so I was wondering if you could maybe speak a bit about the, the non-verbal aspects of psychoanalysis in the sense of thinking about, um, so I'm just, I'm just thinking about, um, you know, the, the transformative element of slave play, for example, that, um, and, mm. and also, um, um, and, um, yeah, I guess, I guess I'm thinking about, do you think, if, if you think there are room for psychoanalytic forms that more take the form of um, of art or drama, they're kind of in the similar way to like art therapy and drama therapy and stuff like that. Do you think there could be a movement into psychoanalytic forms that are more of that kind of way of doing things, or if you think it's inherently a verbal practice? Does that make sense? Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, I'm, I'm I'm glad you brought this up because I was actually thinking. <coughs> Kind of like about something that Adam said in relation to the last question about like some people have an interest or an appetite or a taste for like this kind of like vine swinging, um, and I think sometimes experiences happen that jolt us into that, not because we develop an interest, but because it, the situation demands it of us, or at least it feels like that to us. And for me, slave play was like that. Like I started. To, this is about a play that I write in the book. We started watching it, I watched it once, I became extremely stunned by it, and I just wanted to see it again and again and again, and I had no idea why, and I still don't, even though I've written half a book about it. Um, so I, I do think that there's something to that in psychoanalysis. That's what I mean when I say it's an aesthetic practice, because I don't think it's actually only verbal. Of course, there's certainly modalities that work psychoanalytically and also use other objects, like Myron Milner, about whom you write, kind of like who worked with, with kind of like drawing. So okay, certainly we don't have to constrict it that way. But even when it seems to be only verbal, I don't think that psychoanalysis is, is about what is being said or not said. Uh, I think it's about what gets dropped in between and why, how words, in, what words interrupt. Um, <coughs> I agree. I mean, I mean, child 
psychotherapy is not non-verbal, but it's not entirely verbal mm -hmm. by any means. So what you're talking about, sound trays and so on, um, certainly all child psychotherapists do a lot of not talking and playing, which is not deemed to be as well inferior to the talking mm -hmm. thing. But it would seem to me that <coughs> it would be just from ordinary experience, misleading to sort of fetishize language as the thing. Because it is the thing we do that other animals don't do. A, it doesn't mean there's only one kind of language <coughs> which is verbal, but also it's clear that more goes on between bodies than is exchanged in words. Not, we can't always process it or formulate it, but, it comes, but nevertheless, something is happening. So I would have thought any psychoanalysis that was thought of itself as entirely a verbal exchange, it would be entirely a defensive procedure. Because so much more goes on, and so much more is said than is intended. And so much more is said uh, in tone and rhythm than in content. I mean, Freud in the project says that rhythm yeah. is the only thing that cannot be resisted. Yeah. <coughs> cannot, there's no resistance to rhythm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. We're just coming close to the end. I wanted to give time for one question <laughs> online. Yes. Um, thank you so much for, for this conversation. So I'm just going to pick one question from online. Um, the question is, how can we help our patient become less afraid of keeping the question open what they want? And how can we encourage them to discover arousal rather than being scared of it? The <laughs> question. <for> the end. <laughs> um... Do you want to take it? <laughs> no. no. <laughs> I mean, in a way, if you... <coughs> it seems to me there's a, a um, didactic... I don't know who I'm talking to now. I'm talking to you. <laughs> there's, a, there's a didactic level answer to this question, which is, of course, you can make suggestions, you can encourage people to try things out, etc., etc. But in a way, you can think this is the question that everybody comes to analysis for, which is to um, find a, a conversation that isn't only a verbal conversation about what they are frightened of and drawn to. Two things very often going together. And then it's to do with a capacity to um, bear, and not contain, but bear emotional experience. Because everybody, when they were babies and very little and so on, had unmediated, intense feelings. <coughs> and obviously one learns to speak very, very late in the day. By the time you get to speak, you're, you know, you've had a whole life. So that the, the language, it's not that it's a fashion accessory, but it's an add-on. It feels like it's the thing, mm -hmm. obviously because we all do it, mm -hmm. but it feels like it's a thing, partly because it's such a useful defensive instrument against intense feeling and arousal. Mm -hmm. So, I, w I would recommend a bit of encouragement and a bit of um, description of anxieties about excitement and risk. Um, I'm, I'm always going to side with excitement and risk. Um, <laughs> but I, I, would, I would say to a question of that sort, um, how do I help a patient who X do Y? Um, I think this is a genre of a question. And it presumes that the analyst is in a position to, if only one knows, one can implement. And to me, these kinds of questions, it's, it's worth considering when a question like that comes to our minds. Um, what, what is it that we are not kind of like able to let go of? Why are we looking for the recipe or the, um, the instruction, the didactic aspect? Um, so I, I was, wanted to come back to your question about also doing like, treatment in conditions of war, right? Um, you know, sometimes I've been asked, but isn't overwhelm a privileged category only for those who are so kind of like able to hold themselves together that they get to be broken? And I actually think that it's, it's even more urgent for and more, and it actually also is something that people who are very traumatized also gravitate to more. It's even more urgent in the domain of conditions like that 
because there's less to risk because so much has already been gone. So like part of what I find in, I'm supervising somebody right now who is, um, let me think about this. <laughs> um, if one were to be working with a patient who is in a <coughs> situation of war um, or in, in a, <coughs> I'm, I'm, of course, I'm thinking of Gaza right now. There's no way to think about that without thinking about Gaza right now. When so much has disappeared and so much has dissipated, it is the analyst that needs the fortitude to stay present. And the question of like how to do this for another person is to miss, in my opinion, that, that it is the anxiety that comes with Staying present for that, staying present for the catastrophe. Yeah, yeah, and why it's assumed that the analyst will have an answer to the question. Mm -hmm. I mean, what's you know, what is being, as as the analyst being the one who's supposed to know, if that question is asked directly, anybody who answers it, could, I mean, pragmatically they could answer, it, but they also fall into a certain kind of trap, taken from a position they're not in the position actually to take up, because if the question was to be addressed, it would seem to me it would have to be addressed. Um, uh, between the two people, not addressed to one of them, because it would be a completely misleading picture. Well, we, we will need to stop there. Thank you both so much. It's been a wonderful conversation. Thank you.